Great. So uh, like Christian said, I'm a postdoc at University of Washington in uh, Nick Steinmetz's lab. Um, we've been using NeuroPixels for a few years now, and we've started building tools now to help uh, us plan our experiments and help you plan your experiments. So today is going to be, um, let me start my timer so I don't go off track. Um, today is going to be about 20 minutes of Pinpoint itself, um, a bit of a demo, uh, much more in depth than you might have seen in other places for how to use Pinpoint. Um, and then Kenneth is going to show you, I think, the most exciting part of what we've been working on the last year, which is um, connecting Pinpoint directly with your uh, micro manipulators so that you can see where you are inside the brain in real time. So let's move in that direction. Um, so to start off, this is the Pinpoint interface, which you'll see uh, in just a moment. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about what you're seeing uh, and just orient people if this is the first time you've ever uh, encountered Pinpoint. So our tool is 3D first. So the mouse brain here uh, is shown in, in 3D meshes. And we have the ability for you to search for different areas, highlight them, um, and move the brain around in 3D space. It's nice in 3D because it's it's a little more intuitive than just looking at the 2D slices that you know you might be used to if you've used the Paxinos Atlas um, or another sort of like printed atlas in the past for, for planning. Um, other things in the scene here are the 3D models of the probes. Um, we use real 3D models because uh, we want to help people detect collisions in multi-probe insertion plans. So if you have two or three or eight probes that you're trying to put into a brain, we want to help you make sure that um, your probes aren't going to hit each other. The other things you can see here on the left are the channel maps. So we are, I think, the only planning tool where you can see um, the actual individual channels on the probe. Um, and where, you know, what areas they're going to end up in. So you can plan a recording with 10 or 20 or 40 or whatever um, number of channels in a specific region. Um, and then maybe the most important thing is this little panel on the right side here. This is the sort of probe coordinates panel, um, and it indicates the entry coordinate and the depth relative to some reference coordinate. We usually use Bregma by default for the mouse, um, but I'll show you that in a bit. Um, and these are the coordinates that you actually have to take with you to go and do your surgery um, and insert the probe in the brain. Um, by the way, uh, Christian or Kenneth, um, if you can watch the chat or the Q&A for me, I, I can't actually see them. So if someone asks a question, just forward that to me. Okay, so uh, this is the overview of Pinpoint. Um, what are some of the features that we make available to you? So first of all, uh, we try to make it as easy as possible for you to actually use Pinpoint. So you can go directly to our uh, web application, uh, which is what I'm going to do in, in a, a few minutes, and uh, just use Pinpoint on your laptop. Uh, you can also um, download Pinpoint as a desktop application, um, and you'll have to do this if you want to use it uh, to connect to manipulators because the manipulator uh, SDKs only work through uh, Windows. Um, reach out to us if you're on Linux. We can, we can build for Linux as well, but we've only been doing it to help specific groups. Um, we haven't been sort of generally supporting that. Another uh, nice feature of uh, Pinpoint is, of course, the 3D interface I mentioned before. Um, and this is the kind of scene that you can put together where you highlight specific brain regions. Um, we're also adding features now where you can actually plot individual neurons in the 3D space. Um, and that way, if you've done a bunch of recordings, but you want to sort of fill in the gaps in your recording plan, um, you can pop those neurons into the scene and then you know line up your trajectory perfectly to fill those gaps in. Uh, we support uh, keyboard controls, uh, mouse clicking and dragging. I'll show all of that to you uh, in a few minutes. Um, and we actually also support controllers. Uh, it's a little hard to show you the controller while I'm using it, uh, but uh, you can plug any USB controller into your computer and immediately use it with Pinpoint. Um, it's actually a lot easier to drive the probes with controllers. Um, and if you're using EFISLINK, um, we, we recommend using the controller to control the probes. So more on, more on that in a bit. Um, of course, the reason we built this thing is complex multi-probe recordings. Uh, we want you to plan your cradiotomies, avoid collisions, um, and be able to do all of that from sort of one system. Uh, we do have really easy ways to share and save insertions. There's a button in the corner that creates a unique URL that gets you back to the same scene that you set up. Um, and we're working on better tools for sort of saving entire scenes all at the same time. Um, 
but the share button already works now. Uh, you can put together a scene, however many probes you want, click share, um, and then reopen it on another computer or send it to your collaborators. And we currently support the mouse atlas, which is what's on the web and the desktop versions. Um, we also are getting support for the rat uh, working right now. Um, we'll have it all up by SFN. Um, currently, the rat is for desktop only because the annotation atlas um, crashes the browser because it's too big. Um, but we'll downsample it in, in the next few weeks and get that working on the browser as soon as we can. Um, and I know a lot of people were asking about rat. So yes, it's coming. Um, I'll, I'll show it to you uh, live here. but. Uh, full support in a few weeks. And then, of course, the sort of exciting thing with Sense Apex is that uh, Pinpoint can talk to micro manipulators, um, and we can also forward data to data acquisition software. Um, so I'll show you quickly at the end, if we have time, uh, how you connect Pinpoint to open EFIS so that as you move probes in Pinpoint, you see what's happening with them uh, reflected in your data acquisition itself. So with that, uh, I will pause for just a second in case there's any questions already. Um, and if not, we'll go over a sort of full demo of how to plan a trajectory. No questions so far. Um, Great. So hit it. Okay. So this is Pinpoint. Um, the website I'm at, the website I'm at is data.virtualbrainlab.org slash pinpoint. Um, you could Pull it up right now if you wanted to. Um, to interact with the 3D scene, you can left click with your mouse and drag to move the brain in different directions. And we have this little widget in the corner which helps orient you to which direction um, the brain is oriented, especially because it gets confusing when the brain is upside down. Um, double clicking on these axes snaps the brain to a uh, sagittal, axial, and coronal view, um, which helps you really uh, perfect multi-probe insertions when you have uh, probes that are really close to each other. So that's the 3D scene. Um, you can also zoom in and out uh, with your scroll wheel. I'm going to drop a NeuroPixel uh, 1.0 probe into the scene, since that's what most people have been using recently. And I'm going to change the speed settings here to this rabbit speed. Uh, and to control probes, you have a few different options, um, but my recommendation is to move probes, to snap them to a brain region first, um, and then adjust the position of the probe. Um, so let's imagine that we're trying to hit uh, the ventral tegmental area, which is VTA uh, acronym in uh, the CCF. Um, we can turn that region on as a little 3D model down here, and then we can use the snap button to move the tip of the probe to that region. Um, and when I snapped, you saw two things happen. One, um, the channel map appeared on the left side, showing where we are in the brain. Um, and this in-plane slice also got filled out with uh, a view of uh, the slice that is uh, in plane with the electrodes. Um, and this is looking from the front of the brain. So right now we're in the left hemisphere, uh, but looking from the front, it's the right hemisphere um, on the slice. Um, and you can zoom in and out here to see more or less of the area. Okay, and uh, let's say that we're uh, going to be doing an insertion that's coming um, from the left. Uh, I'm going to use the yaw and pitch values here to rotate the probe. Um, so let's say uh, maybe we're doing a rotation of 45 degrees from the side here, um, and we want to be pitched down um, by 15 degrees. So this might be a super typical kind of insertion that you might want to do. Um, if you want to make small adjust adjustments now, you can use the keyboard keys. So W and S are the anterior posterior keys. Um, I'm going to speed it up so you can see the movements. So W moves you uh, along the probe axis. Sorry, there's a setting here that shouldn't be on. Um, so W and S move you along the AP axis. M and L move you along the, uh, sorry, A and D move you along the M and the ML axis, so the left right axis. Um, Q and E uh, move you along the DV axis. And Z and X move you along the probe's depth axis. Um, so there we're moving in sort of standard stereotactic uh, coordinates. Um, but that setting that I actually turned on here, use local axis for movement, this is under the probes tab, um, switches these axis to be the probes axis. Um, so if you're doing a, a, a strangely rotated uh, insertion, um, you might want to be able to move the probe along the probe's forward axis or along the probe's um, side axis. And the reason you might want to do that is because that's actually the, the axes, the X and Y and Z axes 
um, of the manipulator. So if you're using a sense apex manipulator, for example, these are the ones that you would actually be moving the probe on. So all of the movements that I've been making here um, and all of the coordinates on the right side here are all relative to Bregma. Um, maybe you want to see where Bregma actually is on the mouse brain. Um, you can go into the help menu. Um, by the way, the help menu is uh, accessed by pressing escape. Um, you can go under this rig tab here and turn on the mouse skull. Um, and that gives you a view of where the brain is um, relative to coordinates like Bregma and Lambda. And uh, we can also use this mouse skull to plan craniotomies. So again, back to the settings menu under probes, um, there's a craniotomy feature here. And it's a little rudimentary, um, but you can click one of these craniotomies, so number zero right now, and then drag it along the AP uh, and ML axes to position it, and then change its side. Um, and this user interface will change eventually uh, when we have time to, to update it. So here we have a, a craniotomy um, that's some position relative to Bregma, um, and then we have our actual insertion, um, and the coordinates for that are down here. And all of the stuff I've just shown you, um, all of those details, we have videos and text uh, tutorials that walk you through how to do that kind of planning. Um, and all of that's on our website, uh, virtualbrainlab.org. I'll have a link at the end. Um, and also there's a QR code that I shared at the beginning, which is a link to our uh, eLife paper, um, where you can also find more tutorials and information about all of this. So that's the high level uh, sort of five minute overview of planning and insertion. Um, I'm gonna move on to uh, adding more probes and um, some of the sort of details about the settings in a second. Uh, but again, I wanna pause and make sure uh, that people don't have questions right now. Dan, one question that was brought up in the email was uh, there's some curious. Uh, curiosity about how the Bregma Lambda scaling works. It'd be great if you could talk about that. Yeah, cool. Thanks, Kenneth. So uh, one of the features that we've added, I'm going to turn the skull off, um, is the ability to change the scale of the brain. So the CCF Atlas, um, the average Bregma Lambda distance in the Atlas is about 4, um, 4,150, 4.15 uh, millimeters. So if your uh, mouse's brain is larger than that, or if your rat's brain is larger than the uh, corresponding di distance in the Waxholm Atlas, um, we have an option that allows you to scale the brain up and down um, so that the Atlas is a better fit for your animal. So that feature is here under this Atlas tab, um, and it's just a slider right now. Um, again, we're thinking about how to improve the UI for this, um, but basically you can drag this slider up. Um, I'm just going to put it at the maximum. Um, and the brain will get bigger. So maybe that wasn't really obvious. Let's make the brain really small now. So it's scaling the whole brain relative to Bregma um, and adjusting the insertion coordinates um, based on that information. I'm going to reset it back now. Um, so that's the feature we have there for that. Um, just one thing to be aware of is it's scaling relative to Bregma. Uh, so you do have to reference your entire recording to Bregma to use that feature. Um, and if it's not clear what I mean by that, uh, feel free to send us an email or watch the tutorials. Um, but everything is always relative to some reference coordinate, um, and that reference coordinate is Bregma by default. And it is a setting that you can change um, in the settings here. Um, we have one question from Vincent. Hang on. Um, I've opened your mic for a second. Vincent, you had your hand raised. Um, right, that uh, was might have been a false alarm. We have another question that's come in the chat. Um, no, Vincent, we couldn't hear you. Um, one question is, um, what about the angle between Bregma and Lambda? Is this only compatible with the stereotaxic horizontal mounting? Yeah, so uh, yeah, that was the next thing I was going to demo here. So there are different um, uh, basically transformations of the atlas available in here. And, and we do need to add a sort of custom transformation that lets you tilt the brain in whatever way you want. Um, so right now, uh, this is the uh, standard CCF, and I've switched back to it by using this drop-down menu here to switch to CCF atlas. Um, and the 
default transformation that we have is based on an average of a bunch of MRI um, MRIs that were taken of uh, live mice. So it should be a better fit than the CCF. The CCF, of course, is perfused mouse brains, so they're sort of changed in size relative to the real mouse brain. Um, so I'm going to switch to the uh, that default, um, and you can see the change here. The brain is sort of a little more stretched out, and it was tilted up. Um, and the reason it was tilted up is because uh, the, the tilt matches um, Bregma and Lambda being level on the skull. So if you are leveling your skull, um, this is the transformation you want. Um, if you're not leveling your skull, uh, we will add that feature in, uh, hopefully in a few weeks, where you can type in actually the coordinates that you've measured on your skull relative to Bregma. Um, so you know, you'd move your stereotax to Bregma, move it off to the side, move it somewhere else, move it somewhere else. You tell us where the skull was at all those points on, on the DV depth, um, and then we'll tilt the brain for you to match your actual stereotactic setup. Um, but the simplest thing is just level the skull, and then you don't have to think about this. Thanks for that question. There's one more we've gotten after the mic opening didn't quite work. Vincent kindly sent the question through um, on a message. Um, it's if you can change the colors of the individual individual brain regions, because the brain stem, for example, is is pink, and it can make it hard to see um, separate regions to some conditions. Uh, that's a great idea. Uh, we don't have that right now. Um, uh, and as you'll see in a second, the colors for the rat atlas are kind of kaleidoscopic. Um, so yeah. I, I'll 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 put that on our to-do list. Um, hopefully, it won't take too long to get to it. But changing colors would be a um, a nice feature to have. Okay, um, so going over uh, just a few more quick things. Um, so we do have the ability to uh, add multiple probes. So you can click the add probe button again. Um, you can grab another probe. Uh, it doesn't have to be the same kind of probe you were using before. Um, you can use the same uh, controls to drop the probe into the scene um, and move it around and line it up with any particular recording. Um, and here again, I'm using keyboard keys to move the probe. Um, I'm also clicking uh, on the probe, choosing a keyboard, uh, uh, choosing a direction using the keyboard and then dragging the probe. Um, and I won't explain exactly how that works. You can watch the um, video tutorials if you want to see more about those mouse click controls. So dropping multiple probes in the scene, Super easy. You can get a bunch in there all at the same time. Um, we do immediately detect when uh, collisions happen. So if you run your probes into each other, we'll put up this warning for you um, that your probes are colliding, and you should sort that out for yourself. All right. Um, one more, I think, feature I want to get to in the scene here um, is that we do have different channel maps. So as you receive your new NeuroPixel 2.0 probes with the four shank setup, um, you might want to use uh, different uh, sets of channels during your recording. So right now we're in what we call the um, uh, bank zero, I think, uh, recording mode. So this is all the channels at the tip of the electrode. If you go into the probe dropdown, um, there's a dropdown here uh, that lets you switch between these different um, recording regions. Um, maybe you want to use uh, one sort of column of channels from uh, bank zero and then another column from bank one. That's the double length map. Um, and you can see here what's changed uh, and that we're getting much more distance along the probe now um, along the depth axis, but obviously fewer channels at each location. And we're we're continuing to add uh, more channel maps, and those channel maps can also be updated directly from other programs. So if you're connected to Spike GLX, you can actually pull the channel map uh, from Spike GLX. You don't even have to uh, set it in, in Pinpoint at all. OK, so there are uh, lots of other settings that are hidden in here. There's some convenient settings, like the ability to set the background color to white so you can make pictures for your papers. Um, there's other tools uh, you can change whether other probes are transparent or not. Um, and if these probe panels are getting in the way, um, you can always shrink them down and make them smaller. Um, so lots of graphic settings. Um, there's other settings for the probes and the areas. Uh, if you want to see the full names of areas, um, that settings in here as well. Uh, I'll let you explore those settings um, on your own time and play around with them. Um, and feel free to reach out if you ever find bugs, because we are continuously developing Pinpoint, and we are always looking for feedback to help us um, improve this uh, product. So with that, I'm going to switch 
the share um, because I do want to quickly show you um, the rat atlas uh, and the uh, before we switch to talking about EFIS link. So let me unshare the screen now and pull that up. All right, this is our development environment. Um, so there are new features coming, like the ability to see where Bregma is in real time. Um, but the main thing I wanted to show you is that uh, in the Atlas settings, in the version that's going to come out before SFN, there is going to be a drop down here that lets you switch between different atlases. Um, right now, we have support for the CCF um, and the Wax Home Atlas, and we're hoping to add a lot more atlases. If you are an expert in reference atlases, uh, if you work with the macaque, with ferret, uh, with, uh, I don't know, developmental mouse or rat, um, and you're interested in helping us get more atlases into Pinpoint, um, just send me an email and let's figure it out. Um, we definitely would appreciate your help with this. Um, so to switch, you just choose a different atlas. Um, this resets the scene, so you just click yes, um, and then it pops in the new atlas. Uh, and for uh, whoever asked about colors, um, the colors need to be improved for the rat atlas. So that's um, to do coming soon. Um, but this is the rat atlas here. Um, and again, we can drop probes in the scene, uh, drive them into the atlas. And it looks like there's a bug somewhere in here. So there's some improvements that need to be made. But <laughs> it's there, uh, and it'll be working soon. Um, and whatever bug is going on here with the position of the probes will be fixed by the time that you actually interface with this. OK. So I'm going to pause there and pass it off. Uh, well, first, we'll answer any questions if there are any yes, questions. We, we, have, we have another one um, from Rishi, a question. Um, what about custom atlases? He would love to contribute to adding such a feature if it doesn't exist yet. Yeah, so uh, we're going to add the option to, uh, we're probably going to start with um, custom MRI volumes, but uh, I suppose you could upload any volume. Um, and yeah, coming soon. Um, it would be great to have input from people who are interested in that feature uh, as we build it. Um, so please shoot me a message. Um, you can find me on the NeuroPixel Slack. Uh, you can find my email on our website. Um, get in touch. Let me know exactly what features you're looking for, and we'll you know we'll craft things to get it working um, for your use case. Um, but yeah, custom Alice is definitely coming. Um, the ability to load an MRI volume if you're working with macaque, for example, and then plan your trajectory within the macaque brain um, coming soon as well. OK. So I'm going to pass it off now to Kenneth. Um, so Kenneth is a computer science undergrad at University of Washington, also in the Steinmetz lab. And he's been building um, this very impressive uh, connection between Pinpoint and the uh, SenseFX micro manipulators. Um, and you'll get to see it in real time. So take it away, Kenneth. All right, hello. Um, I'm gonna share my screen and we'll uh, take a look at Aoife's link. Okay, so hopefully I should be spotlighted for everyone. Does that look right? Cool, all right. Um, so Aoife's link and pinpoint, what's going on here? So Ethos Link is a communication layer. It's a platform, it's trying to be platform agnostic and allows us to connect uh, uh, micro manipulator platforms with software applications like Pinpoint. And why would we need this? Well, so the micro manipulators, they speak in their own uh, software application platform, right? And Pinpoint is its own application platform and they these two may not necessarily understand how to talk to each other because they're living in different worlds. And so Ethos Link here acts as like a Rosetta Stone that can federate communication between these two um, platforms that are that may be unaware of each other. And so what may this look like? Well, uh, Pinpoint may be interested in getting the position of the manipulators that, and as you're running your experiment. And this could be written in some language and Ethos Link will then take this command and convert that into uh, the specific SDK calls for uh, the SenseFX manipulators, which will then reply and we can get that information back out. We can also go the other direction too and ask Pinpoint can request for the manipulator to move to certain positions. And again, this would then be translated into specific uh, specific SDK calls 
that the manipulator will understand and be able to run. Uh, so that's kind of like the general overview of, of what ethoslink does. Uh, so let's take a look at what it actually looks like in action. So here uh, is a desktop application, uh, is a desktop version of Pinpoint running. And over here, I just have a little terminal window open. Ethoslink is a very small and compact uh, server, Python server that just runs in the background. It's pretty much invisible once you get it up and running. Uh, what it's doing here is once I've launched it, it's looking for manipulators. So it detects manipulators numbers uh, six and seven, which are just the numbers I have in front of me. And it's uh, relaying the information to pinpoint. Uh, so what that may look like is here, uh, you see me in the lab. Uh, this may be a sub you're familiar with. You have a sense effects manipulator, your four wheel uh, controller and the touchscreen controller. I'm just gonna turn my camera off to the side a little bit. There's a second manipulator here, but uh, this camera is very small. So we're gonna just look at this for now. Um, you'll notice in the scene, I have two probes that are set up to match the angles of what I have uh, in the lab. And the purpose of this is to give you an accurate representation of your lab in Pinpoint. Uh, with this, you can, uh, let me just turn off the camera real, real quick. Uh, in here, you can connect your uh, probes in the scene, like this, these two blue ones, to the manipulators that you have in real life. So manipulator six, which is the one on the left side is connected to the left side probe. When this connection is made, you can now uh, have them talk to each other in real time. So I come over here with the rotary uh, controller. I can move on the X axis, the uh, probe number six, you'll see the light light up and you'll notice how the manipulator, as I move it, the probe in pinpoint is also moving along with it. And this is useful in that when you're running an actual experiment, you can now see where you are uh, in the brain based on uh, your trajectories plan. So for instance, if I'm, uh, let's say I drive it down into the brain, as I'm moving on like the D axis to drive my probe into the brain, you can see it reflected in real time in pinpoint and you can explore the different regions and the channel maps that you are hitting. So that's one direction of uh, communication where we go from uh, the sense effects manipulators and pinpoints requesting position information off the manipulators and bringing that into pinpoint for you to view. You can also go the other direction or just reset this back to the home position first. Uh, and so you can go the other direction now where uh, one of the settings you may have noticed in pinpoint is that you can enable manual control. And what this means is that you can now use the same controls you're used to for moving the probes as Dan showed like with the controller and with the keyboard, you use those exact same controls and now uh, move your manipulators in, in their lab based on just those controls. So what does that look like? So here with uh, probe number six selected, I can now use the WASD keys and uh, move the probes around. So I'm hitting the A key right now and you'll notice how this uh, probe is now moving very slowly to uh, it's moving at a thousand um, microns, a thousand micron increments as I'm moving the probe around. Uh, it's a little bit hard to see in, re in real life because that's only like one millimeter worth of movement. But you can also take look, take a look at the uh, touchscreen controller and notice how the uh, position is changing. So you can use this to uh, navigate around your scene, and also if you're uh, working with a scenario where you don't have a rotary encoder, you can also use the keyboard. And so I can just look the keyboard out, like I'm pressing the Z key to drive down on the depth axis. And you can notice how the uh, probe is driving down and you can see the channel maps update in real time. All right, so that was a quick overview of the whole process and go back to the presentation real quick. So with this, you we now have basically have communication going in two directions both from gathering uh, data from the manipulators, like positional information, and also sending positional information back to the manipulators. Um, and this is all done in real time. And one thing that we're kind of working on with this bi-directional communication is uh, automation, because now that we have full control of the manipulators and also understand where they are in space, we can now actually automate the process of the uh, electrophysiology uh, like setup and insertion. This is a this is a new feature that we've been developing. We're actively developing, and we're at the point now where we're like to welcome beta testers uh, to gather feedback and also to work with different labs to understand what are the different uh, specific features that you guys are looking for and how can we basically make your electrophysiology experiments uh, work faster. Uh, and so that's the goal with this. And 
definitely reach out to us if you're interested in seeing automation. This is particularly useful in like multi-probe insertions where like the complex geometry of just handling many uh, probes at the same time can just get really complicated and really mundane. And so having the having pinpoint uh, just automatically help you move your probes into place and help you drive multiple probes in parallel, that can really speed up your experiment time. So yeah, I uh, definitely like to open up the floor for questions and feel free to reach out to us, uh, both Dan and I, if you're interested in beta testing automation. Yeah, so the pinpoints VTC are like just four, uh, four breakdowns that we have. Uh, when we send speed information to Sendipex, uh, to the Sendipex manipulators, we're just giving it uh, like my micrometers per second information. So there's not necessarily like a speed breakdown, it's just pure, uh, we can give it any speed essentially. And so whatever speed we choose to send from pinpoint is just what the sense effects manipulator will pick up. Yeah, and I that's think through the SDK. If, if if I can quickly chime in, the the, sure. the, the, the six speeds on the sense effects manipulator are really only for, um, for for how the rotations on the rotary wheel unit translate to to speed, right? How many rotations correspond to what? So the manipulator itself, when you're driving it from software, you give it an arbitrary speed and tell it to move. Um, it is really that the speed settings are really only for that communication between the rotary wheel and um, and the manipulator. So the, the software will is completely free to set whatever it chooses to do. And for um, for everybody, just to add a small piece of context, um, the speeds in pinpoint there there really need to be numbers there, um, but they are one, ten, a hundred, and a thousand micrometers per step, um, and those speeds get translated directly to um, EFIS link. One other question that I remember seeing in the email, um, or like that was was pre submitted, was uh, about support for three like the UMP three manipulators. So EFIS link is its own individual program, uh, which means that it supports basically any manipulator that you want to connect to it, as long as we create the right bindings for it. So SenseFX has a SenseFX API, and we just create bindings for the SenseFX API uh, into the EFISLink uh, like platform agnostic system, which will then like allow any application like Pinpoint to talk to it. Uh, so with that being said, the UMP3 manipulators uh, can be supported. We don't have one in the lab to like, show you, but uh, we do have support for three axis manipulators. It's the same binding system. And so if I had a three axis manipulator, I would show you, but uh, we don't. So to answer the question, it does work. And I'm reading another question. Will there be support to adjust speeds during insertion? Uh, faster? Oh, actually, this is really, this is a really good question. So this is actually part of our, uh, our automation system with EFIS Copilot where we drive, where we control the uh, insertion. And with that, we do actually have the ability to set these speeds and we're following a couple like guidelines on this. Like uh, one example is that we have a certain speed that you're driving down. And once you get within a like certain close range distance, like one, uh, like a thousand micrometers from your target, we will slow down the insertion speed. Um, and basically that's all being controlled through the automation software. So you don't have to deal with it when you're driving. I, ho I hope that answered your question. All right, so let me close it out with uh, the other side um, of the sort of connecting to hardware and software. Um, so you've now seen, let me share, I guess my whole screen. Um, is that showing up for people? Well, so you've now seen how to connect Pinpoint with uh, hardware. Um, and then the other end of this is, it would be great to connect with your data acquisition software and forward where you are in the brain so that you can see it side by side with your electrophysiology data. So how do we do that? Um, so I've got the Open EFIS GUI running here. Um, I'm gonna run it in simulation mode because I don't actually have uh, any NeuroPixels plugged into my computer here. Um, and I'm gonna put a NeuroPixels 1.0 probe um, in here. So the, the um, processor that you need um, is this probe viewer processor, uh, which you should be able to have if you're running the latest Open EFIS GUI. Um, I'm not sure, I don't remember whether there's an installation step or not, but we have it in our tutorial. Um, so you can check that out on the website. Okay, so once this is set up and you have your probe viewer um, dropped in here, uh, you can head back to uh, Pinpoint and you can go into the settings um, and there's an API tab down here. 
Um, and one of the different API options is the Open EFIS API. Um, and you turn it on. Um, it is connecting to a server that Open EFIS is running. Um, and that server does need to be turned on. Um, and again, in the tutorials, we have some instructions for exactly how uh, to set that up. Um, so once that's connected, uh, you can drop a probe in the pinpoint scene. Um, and because uh, we don't actually, you know, if you have multiple probes running in Open EFIS and multiple probes in pinpoint, we don't know which ones should be connected to which ones. Um, so you do have to link them to each other. Um, so this probe, 0 CFD here, um, we're going to link it to probe A uh, in the Open EFIS GUI. Um, and then any changes we make to the anatomical position get reflected in the GUI over here. Um, and if we were running a real um, data set, uh, you would see your electrophysiology data live um, alongside the proposition in the brain. Um, so the reason you might want to use this, of course, is it helps a lot for telling whether um, the boundaries between regions are lining up with where they're supposed to be. For someone like me, um, who constantly drives straight through visual cortex and straight into the hippocampus, um, it helps a lot to see visually that I'm I'm going too far um, and that I'm about to cross a boundary. And then you can start to learn how to see those boundaries um, in the electrophysiology data itself. So I'll pause again if there's any questions. Um, and this does work for Spike GLX as well. Um, and I'll I'll let you watch the uh, I'll let you read the tutorial instructions for that. They're a little bit more complicated than the Open EFIS setup. Um, so I'm not gonna take time to show that right now. Okay. So uh, everything we've shown you, um, we have tutorials, uh, written tutorials and video tutorials. Um, you'll find them on our website, virtualbrainlab.org. Um, all the links are in the pinpoint section. Um, we have an explanation for how to get it installed. Um, we have all the tutorials I've talked about, and then we have this EFIS link section, which explains how to get uh, the Python server running on your computer um, and some troubleshooting tips uh, in case you run into problems. Um, and then this in vivo alignment section talks about the um, transforms that we use to tilt the brain and change its size um, to match Bregma lambda distance and, and so on. And with that, uh, We'll stop there. Um, I do want to say a quick thank you. Um, Pinpoint is supported by a lot of different people, um, including a lot of folks in the IBL, um, as well as at the Allen Institute and Janalia. Um, and we really appreciate their help. And of course, thank you to SenseApex for hosting us today and for giving us access to such a good micro manipulator platform. Um, this QR code, by the way, links to the paper. Um, so feel free to pull that up. Uh, in the future, and there's a nice a nice written tutorial in there as well, um, and some uh some more discussion of sort of the under the hood details of how pinpoint works um so with that i'll stop sharing and take any more questions that that uh while we still have time cool yeah we have um uh, another bunch of questions coming in one is is from rishi um promising that it's the last question from him, but it doesn't have to be. I mean, we're, we're, we're thrilled to get this amount of interaction here, right? Um, can one export or save manipulator to Atlas coordinate transforms for later data analysis purposes? Yes. Um, uh, yes, absolutely. So uh, it's not in the version. Um, so un under the hood to get the RAD Atlas working, we made a bunch of changes. Um, and one of the changes we made is that it's much easier now to export uh, information about the transforms, about the atlas that you're in, um, and you know, in sort of standard JSON format, information about the insertions. So uh, we are going to have a sort of scene export that just exports everything for you, um, and then you can take that and and put it in your data analysis pipeline um, in in whatever way you want. Uh, so that will be in the version that's up live uh, by SFN, um, but. Uh, if you load the web version right now and you hit the share button, it just gives you this link that reloads the website with the same scene. Um, but it doesn't have uh, all the information about the coordinate transforms right now. Oh, we've got more coming so, through. Yeah, let me let me address each of these. So uh, Muhang asked, uh, is it possible to load customized channel maps for NeuroPixel 1 and NeuroPixel 2? Um, how could I pull the channel map from Spike GLX? So, uh, we don't have the option to load like an MRO file, for example, um, to get a totally custom map. Um, there is a all map, uh, which just turns on all the electrodes. You can see everything. Um, so for now, that's the easiest way to see sort of roughly where you are relative to what your custom map is going to look like. 
Um, we do want to add custom channel maps in the future, um, but it's just not as high priority as getting the Rad Atlas working and you know getting macaque and custom volumes working and so on. Uh, Vincent asked, can you save the config for a given recording? So um, I think I addressed that with Rishi's uh, question. Um, yes, coming soon. Uh, Mike asked, uh, after adjusting for brain size, what amount of position error can you normally expect? Um, this is an incredibly hard problem to answer. So the sort of ideal thing would be to do a whole bunch of insertions, you know, in a grid basically across the whole brain, um, and then compare where you end up with where you started um, and figure out kind of what's the variability across mice. Um, unfortunately, we haven't done that experiment um, and it doesn't seem like something that, you know, we've, we've tried basically to get funding for it um, and people are, funders are just not that excited about answering that question. They think that for mice, it doesn't really matter. Um, so we don't know. Um, what we do know from the IBL data set uh, is that uh, on average, if you take a sort of random postdoc and you tell them to target the same spot um, across many different mice, um, they tend to have a standard deviation of about 400 microns. Um, so that's that's reasonable variability um, across brains. And some of that comes from the experimenter um, sort of misestimating where Bregma is. Uh, and some of that comes from uh, variability, variability across different mouse brains. Um, and then there's one last question here from Pierre. Uh, once you have your animal on the rig, what's the best way to position correctly um, to get the virtual brain aligned with the actual brain? Um, so the critical thing here is to reference everything to Bregma. So the coordinates that you read out from Pinpoint are relative to Bregma. Um, so basically, when you're doing your real surgery, you take your uh, probe attached to your micro manipulator, um, you move it to Bregma, and then you zero all the axes. Um, and that way, then you just need to move your manipulator to get it uh, to the same entry coordinate that you're reading out from, from Pinpoint. Um, and then, yes, uh, you do want to add that Bregma Lambda scaling um, if you have time for it. So you make one measurement at Bregma, then you move your probe to uh, Lambda, um, you get that distance, and then scale the brain uh, internally, and then that'll adjust the entry coordinate to account for um, the difference between the brain you're working with and uh, the CCF Atlas, uh, uh, the original size of the CCF Atlas. Um, these are great questions. Um, by the way, feel free to reach out to us directly um, if if you run into more questions about this stuff, or if you run into bugs, uh, because of course we're we're building Pinpoint right now, we're adding things to it all the time, um, and we do occasionally break things. So let us know if anything weird ever happens. Cool. Um, it looks like the uh, the constant flow of questions has has ended off. Uh, which means we've either uh, answered every question anybody has, or we've confused everyone slightly. I, given the um, yeah wonderfully concise presentation you gave, I assume it's probably closer to the first. Um, I have no doubt people are going to go away uh, and and think this through and then have questions. So as as Dan said, I mean, reach out to 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 Kenneth and Dan directly. Um, you've got my email as a contact. Um, by all means, drop by our booths at SFN. Uh, Sensapex uh, NPI are going to be there, um, and separate booths. Um, Dan is is going to be floating around as well, and um, there definitely is going to be a chance to catch up there. Um, if there are no further questions, um, I think it's for us to thank you, um, both Kenneth and Dan, for taking the time and giving this really, really useful um, and, and inspirational presentation on, on showing us what potential you have with that software. Um, yeah, and it'll be exciting to see how these things develop over the coming years. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Thanks, Christian. Yes, thank you. I think with that, we can start wrapping up.